The Doppelganger. Last year, I attended a cultural anthropology course at my college. I met the girl next to me. We chatted idly for a few moments, and friendship started when we figured out that we shared a name. She was older than I was by a few years, but somehow, she always seemed less knowledgeable about the world than I ever did. Despite her innocence, we got along great, and soon I called her my second best friend. Then one day, she had the same glasses that I did. I didn't notice after all. Geeky girls tend to flock towards similar fashion trends, and I continue telling her all about my life. It isn't until now that I understand her unusual silence. She wanted to twist her answers to match mine almost perfectly. I started dating a boy from that class, a mutual friend of ours, and we got along be better than she and I did. Two weeks after we got together, she dyed her hair red, emulating my natural color as best as she could. A week, and she was dressing like me too. Soon, she started calling me her, her wafu and twin, as though by holding my tighter, I wouldn't notice her oddness. I was in love at that point, at least as much as you can, after dating someone for two months, and she expressed the fact that she had been feeling for him the entire time. It was then I realized why she had tried to hook up with my previous boyfriend, who I thought it creepy and told me afterwards she was trying to become me. The last straw was when I cut my hair, and hers was cut the same way literally seven hours after. My roommate was creeped out, all my friends were freaked out, and I was done. I stopped talking to her as politely as I could, and she got the message fairly quickly. The kicker? She's following someone else around, and goes by her middle name to make it more like the other person's. Some crazies don't stop being crazy. Eve. Eve and I were very good friends. Note the were. She was a strange girl. Barely had any friends when I first met her in high school. I had started in 8th grade rather than 7th grade, so nearly everyone in my grade at that point had formed their own cliques. I found myself classified under the lazy stoners. I had talked to Eve once through Facebook. She was not a happy girl. I had just met her and she was spilling all of her secrets about self-loathing, self-harming, suicidal thoughts, and the like. I, I felt bad for her. My heart ached since I sympathized with what she was dealing with. We became friends, started hanging out at school and outside. After a while, Eve changed. It was more of an eerie change than anything. She started growing possessive of me, saying I couldn't hang around other people. She told me she loved me and couldn't live without me. At the time, there were no red flags going off in my head. She was my friend who had lived a not-so-easy life thus far and was just happy to finally have someone there for her. It got out of control when she gave me the silent treatment for a week after I got a boyfriend. But he's not even good to you, she'd say after her silence. He doesn't treat you right, which was wrong. He treated me like a princess and spoiled me silly and reminded me of my beauty inside and out. It's not going to last, I just know it. She was right. The relationship lasted all of one month and three days. Because Eve decided she had something to say to him. To this day, I... I still don't know what she said that possessed him to leave. We were happier, so I thought. Somewhere along the timeline of our friendship, my dad died of a heart attack. She was very supportive, and I will be forever grateful for her support and love during that time. Something broke inside of her, I think, seeing me like that. She had started taking copious amounts of drugs and became distant. Two weeks later, she moved to a different province with her mother. She had been raped. We still spoke occasionally, and she seemed to be doing well enough, but the paranoia of her rapist coming to find her spooked her. 
I stayed up countless nights talking to her on the phone about everything. It hurt to hear some of these things. Once, she told me that, after she had gotten raped, she told her mother what happened, and her mom yelled at her saying it was her fault for being raped, and she bet she enjoyed it anyways. I've met Eve's mother before, and she's one of the sweetest moms I've ever met. Plus, she's a great cook. I could not see her saying something so cruel to her, to her only daughter. I withdrew after that, not sure what to make of the whole ordeal. But one night, man, this... This is where I could just not be her friend anymore. One night, I got a Facebook message from her. It started off normal enough. We were talking about our days. Then it took a turn. She started telling me how much she loved me. And not just as a friend. She said how the thought of anyone touching her body again made her feel sick. But she loved the feel of my hands on her. Things like that. I never once seen Eve under that light. Pretty much all of my friends know I am bisexual. But Eve never gave the slightest hint towards her sexuality. So I had just assumed she was straight. Up until that point, she never talked about anyone romantically or sexually now that I think about it. My replies became less frequent and more hostile the longer the conversation went on. Something was off. I'm not sure how to explain it. S something... Something just did not feel right about this situation. And my gut was right. She started talking about getting raped again by her original abuser, and then taking the rape kit at the hospital. I was not for this plan. She said she had found someone willing to help her. His name was Alex. Right off the bat, I hated Alex. He wanted sexual favors in return for helping her. I told her my distaste for this plan, and how I was willing to help in any way I possibly could, as long as the plan did not involve her getting hurt again. At this point, it just seemed ridiculous to me, so I started texting her cell phone. No answer. After a while, Eve said she was going to go see Alex that night, and instead he was going to help her kill herself. I started panicking. I don't remember at all that happened that night. My mind was racing and my adrenaline was pumping like crazy. All I knew was that I had to save Eve. I started spam calling and texting Eve's phone, but got her voicemail. I checked to see if she was still logged onto Facebook. She wasn't. I called and called and called. 20 minutes or so later, I received a text from an unknown number. I did a reverse lookup of the number and found it was from the same place Eve was living at the time. It said something along the lines of, If you keep calling her, you're just going to make it worse for her. I asked, who the fuck is this? To which I got the laughing emoji and a detailed text message about tying my friend up, drugging her, and using her like the little whore she was. The text involved details about the things whoever on the other line wanted to do to her. I won't say everything, but there was something he had mentioned about a curling iron. I freaked out. I instantly looked up her area's police number and immediately dialed after reading the text. I was crying when the operator answered, bless her heart. She was remaining calm and wasn't pushing me for too many details at once. I explained the situation to her, my suicidal friend, the rape, her guy friend, the Facebook messages, and finally the text. She asked me where my friend lived, which I didn't know. I gave her my friend's cell phone number instead. They found her location and asked me for my number so as to give me a call back. Between all the stress, adrenaline, and fear, I accidentally gave them my old phone number, so they never called me back. I did get a text message from Eve's number through about 30 minutes later. Eve said, Why'd you fucking call the cops on me? The whole house was sleeping when they got here. I was so confused. I... I... But the unknown number knew I'd been texting and calling her cell phone? How could they have known if she had had her phone with her? Absolutely nothing added up. I cried all night. I had nightmares about what the unknown number had said to me. Every night, I'd imagine myself being tortured and used by a masked man. That night, I called my best friend who also lived in an another province. I told him everything that happened in between sobs. He comforted me and confirmed that I wasn't going crazy and that I hadn't just made the whole thing up. I made sure to make a screenshot about everything and send it to him. He agreed that nothing added up about what she said in the whole conversation and even after that as well. 
It's been nearly a year since this occurred. I feel bad and judge me all you want, but I blocked her number after that. I blocked all three of her Facebook accounts. I blocked everything I could. Every couple of months or so, I get a call from an unknown number. I never answer it. The voicemail consists of her telling me how much she loves me. Creepy part is, I've chained my phone twice and the number is since the incident. Just last week, I got a message request on Facebook from a profile bearing her name. It explained how she will never forget me. I left a mark on her, a mark that was never going away. More rambling about her overflowing love for me. I just need to see your face, please. You're so special to me. It ended with her telling me she was back. I blocked that new account, too. I'm so sorry, Eve, but please. Let's not meet again. My friend became a stalker. I had four friends in high school. We had lunch together, had sleepovers together, threw parties together. My best friend Naomi was in the group, as was another girl, Tina. Tina suffered from bipolar disorder, depression, and mild disassociative identity disorder, but she would keep this a secret for four more years. She always had dark blemishes on her arms and legs, which she would later confess were self-inflicted burns. She alluded to her difficult home life, but never elaborated. All throughout high school, I was unaware of her difficulties. We sat together in class, but never really bonded. She was difficult to talk to, as she never opened up and rarely expressed emotions. It was a bit like talking to a brick wall, though we would joke around sometimes. I didn't really enjoy her company. Everything felt forced between us. I began to harbor resentment, and she appropriated Naomi as her own. They began to do everything together. Their friendship was unnervingly intense. It seemed like they would spend almost every night together, and I was jealous, as Tina took up all of Naomi's time. After graduation, Two of the girls in our friend group moved on, while Tina, Naomi, and I enrolled in the same local university. When class started, Tina and Naomi stopped spending time together. I awoke one morning around 1 a.m. to a distressing series of text messages from Tina along the lines of, I can't do it anymore, and I'm sorry for those who still care. I called Tina repeatedly, but she never answered. I sent her a text message threatening to call the police, and finally, she responded, she, she confided in me about her disorders, her lifelong depression, and how Naomi had abandoned her. The texting lasted for hours and became a nightly ritual. Much to my dismay, as Tina would sometimes threaten to kill herself if I did not reply, I lost a lot of sleep that semester. Tina and I took an English class together, which she frequently skipped. One day, though, I couldn't shake the sense of foreboding I felt when she didn't show up for class. She never answered her phone, and so I went to her dorm. I explained my situation to the help desk, potentially suicidal friend, really worried, etc. But they were absolutely useless. I managed to slip past another student into the stairwell, and I ran up to Tina's room. I knocked and knocked, but she never answered. So I went and got the RA. The RA beat on the door with impressive vigor, and finally, as disheveled Tina came, she was pissed. A few weeks later, she would curse me out for embarrassing her like that. One night, Tina confessed that some anonymous person, to whom she never assigned a masculine or feminine pronoun, was the source of her depression. They had dated for many years and recently broke up. Tina loved them, was obsessed with them, could not sleep without them. I couldn't imagine who this person was, how... How had Tina maintained a secret relationship all throughout high school? Then again, she was good at keeping secrets. About a month later, before Thanksgiving break, Tina drank two bottles of NyQuil and wound up in the ICU. I visited her and gave the post-suicide attempt lectures. Although everything sounded so cliche out loud, I finally worked out the courage to ask if she was in love with Naomi. 
She confirmed this and assured me that she was not a lesbian, saying that Naomi was the only girl to whom she had ever been attracted to. They had this intense, indescribable bond. Tina had fallen for her instantly. I felt bad that she had felt the need to hide her sexuality from her closest friends all throughout high school. Although I was mainly bewildered that Tina and Naomi had managed to date secretly for so long. Naomi was my best friend after all. Tina told me about her four plus guy friends who had committed suicide recently, one of whom was a close childhood friend. I couldn't believe it. It was like the contagious hysteria of Salem witch trials. I felt awful for her, yet spending time with her was still a chore. We had virtually nothing in common. I was bound to her by a sense of obligation and by my link to Naomi. Over Christmas break, Naomi informed me that Tina had died in a car accident a week before. She had been riding in a car with three other teenagers in the early hours of the morning. They were all high, and the driver crashed into a tree. A branch impaled her lung. The funeral was private, and Tina's family didn't want to be bothered. I felt oddly numb considering how much time I had spent trying to prevent Tina's death. However, I was relieved that she had not died by her own hand, and I hoped she was in heaven. I couldn't find an obituary, but I found an article detailing an accident involving four anonymous teens in a nearby town. Later that afternoon, one of my friends called me and said, Tina's not dead. Suspicious of the circumstances surrounding Tina's demise, she drove to Tina's house and found her watching TV on the couch. Naturally, I was livid. However, Tina apologized, saying that she never meant for it to go that far. I told her that she was harassing Naomi, but she was defensive. Unable to shake my sense of obligation, I continued to spend time with her. Meanwhile, Naomi, who I didn't see much that semester, was being harassed by a myriad of anonymous texters claiming to be Tina's drug dealers. We know where you live, they would say. We want the best for Tina. Get back together with her. Once they told Naomi that Tina had just overdosed and it was all her fault, Naomi cried for a week, too full of shame to tell anyone. After seven days, she received a text message. I'm not dead. I just wanted to know how you would feel. Gradually, they overdosed one by one. Each texter would be replaced by a new one when the old one died off, each more hostile than the last. This is all your fault. There's blood on your hands and you're not taking responsibility. We're coming for you. Naomi changed her cell phone number three times to no avail. You think you can get rid of us that easily? They would ask. One night, she received a text message saying that one of the drug dealers had found Tina's dead body hanging from a belt in her closet. Naturally, Naomi was skeptical. The dealer then sent Naomi a picture of Tina's face, her eyes closed and a belt around her neck. Naomi didn't want to believe. Eventually, Tina, miraculously resurrected, began texting her again. Naomi asked her to call off the druggies, but she refused, claiming they only wanted to help her. One night, Tina Skyped Naomi from a hotel room. She said that she used her savings to buy a ticket to New York City, where she intended to kill herself after visiting the major landmarks. Well, she had gone sightseeing that morning, so it was time. Naomi sat on her bed in a stupor, refusing to look at the webcam. After 20 minutes of awkward silence, Tina's face disappeared from the screen. She texted Naomi that she had slit her wrists and was unable to Skype because of the copious amount of running down her arms and pulling on her computer. However, she later informed Naomi that the hotel staff had broken into her room, seen her half-dead body, and managed to revive her. On another night, the drug dealers texted Naomi that Tina had just told them goodbye for the last time. She had somehow obtained a gun, and she planned to drive to an abandoned road and shoot herself. After some time passed, one of the drug dealers informed Naomi that they had found Tina's car on the side of the road. It was empty, and blood was splattered on the headrest. They said that they managed to track Tina down by following a trail of blood leading from a car to a field. They gathered up her body and took her to one of their houses. One of their dads was apparently a doctor. The dad hooked Tina up to a crash cart and allowed her to speak to Naomi on the phone every night that week. And every night, 
Tina would call Naomi, but be ping of her heart monitor in the background and ask to hear a story. In the midst of the story, the heart monitor would suddenly flatline and the call would hang up. Then, a number would text Naomi saying that Tina had just flatlined, but she would generally recover within the hour. On one of the nights, the doctor texted Naomi saying that in his professional opinion, Tina would not last the night. He offered to pick up Naomi at her dorm to let her say goodbye and she agreed. He told her to look for a red truck. She stayed up all night, but the truck never showed. A few days later, Tina resumed contact with Naomi. Having been resurrected once more, she begged Naomi to come to her room because she was hurt. She had been jumped. Earlier that evening, having recovered from the trauma of shooting herself in the head, Tina had decided to take a nighttime stroll about the campus. A gang of girls descended on her, knocked her head against a brick wall, pushed her down, kicked her repeatedly in the stomach, and stole her wallet. Somehow, Tina managed to crawl up to her room and in get into bed before apprising Naomi of this tragedy. When Naomi came over, Tina indeed had a scratch on her forehead, a black eye, and bruises all over her stomach and legs. The druggies hacked into Naomi's computer, stole her contact info, and changed all of her passwords. Since Tina had written Naomi's college application essay, they threatened to tell the administration and have Naomi kicked out of school. They texted Naomi's parents, pretending to be concerned classmates. They said that Naomi was partying every night and failing all of her classes. Finally, Naomi was forced to spill all to her family. They resolved to file a police report the next day. When Naomi told Tina that she intended to file a report on her friends, Tina appeared on her doorstep, crying. Please don't do this. Everything will trace back to me. I don't know how they did it. But everything will trace back to my computer. Naomi filed a report the next day nonetheless, to both the campus and local police. They promised to look into the matter, but nothing ever came of it. One night, Tina texted Naomi saying that she had just swallowed a whole bottle of NyQuil and was preparing to drink two more. Naomi reluctantly traversed the campus and arrived at Tina's dorm. Tina led her in the front door and led her up to the bedroom, where she crawled into bed and began shaking and shivering and claiming to have hallucinations. Naomi waited for Tina to go to sleep and stood to go. Tina opened her eyes and asked where Naomi was going, to which she replied, I can't deal with you anymore, or something along those lines. Tina got out of bed and retrieved another bottle of NyQuil, which she began drinking. When Naomi ripped it away and poured it down the sink, Tina retrieved another bottle of NyQuil and started drinking, saying, This is all your fault, between gulps. Naomi snatched that bottle too and left. It was about this time that Tina landed in the hospital, and everything came to light. Naomi and I began spending time together again, and she told me about how their romantic relationship began during our junior year of high school. While Naomi was riding back from the metropolis with her parents, Tina texted her saying that she couldn't do it anymore. I have the pills right here. If you don't come over, I'm going to do it. Well, still being three hours out of town, there was little Naomi could do. When she arrived back in town, Tina said that she had already taken enough pills to kill herself. She begged Naomi to come over, but being without a car and with parents that did not approve of Tina and refused to drop their daughter off at Tina's house, Naomi had to stay at home. Tina then drove across town in her weakened state and picked Naomi up herself. They drove back to Tina's house and laid on her bed, crying. After several hours, Tina said that she thought it was time. Thinking it was the only thing that would cheer Tina up in her final moments, Naomi kissed her. Suddenly revived in the manner of Snow White or Sleeping Beauty, Tina stood up and went into the kitchen to make spaghetti. Now back to college, I attempted to distance myself from Tina after her fake death, but before I could cut things off cold turkey, I felt compelled to convince her to visit a preacher I know who's really good with counseling. One day, Tina told me she had a brain tumor. She didn't yet know whether it was malignant or benign, but she needed me to pick her up from her procedure the following week. Naturally, I wasn't to tell her mother because Tina didn't want to worry her. Tina was having a stereotactic brain biopsy in which four small holes are drilled into the skull in order to support a metal halo. Another hole is drilled at the site of the tumor 
and a needle is then inserted through the skull into the brain. Ain't no small potatoes. So on the day of appointed procedure, I called the hospital. They said they had no patient by that name. When I picked her up, she was sitting at a picnic table outside the hospital. No wristband and no discharge papers. She was wearing a baseball cap, and I asked to see the site of the incision, but she refused to remove the cap because the breeze was irritating her holes. That week, after much persuasion, she agreed to see the preacher, but only if I would drive her. Was I leery about driving someone who claimed to be intermediately possessed by demons to something they thought was an exorcism? Yes. So when the preacher canceled the appointment due to the birth of his granddaughter, I was rather relieved. I never saw her again after that day at the hospital. Except from a distance, we still go to the same school. The last text I sent her was to say that the appointment was canceled. Irritated by my aloofness, she sent me a barrage of texts a few days later, talking about how she was worried by my silence, how much she loved me, etc. I guess I feared transference, so I never responded. Frankly, I was glad to be done with it. She's still alive and in a long-term relationship with another girl. Ironically, her old roommate during all of those shenanigans. She still texts Naomi once in a blue moon, asking to revive their friendship. Anyways, Tina, let's not meet. <laughs>